He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. I was always fascinated by politics, so like even since I was young, way too young actually to understand politics. Meet Ibrahim Omer. He's not exactly old yet, but he knows a lot more about politics as he nears the end of his first term as New Zealand's first African MP. As an MP, we're not just here to be like, you know, a tick box or for tokenism. We are here to contest, we are here to compete, we are here to win, and we are here to represent, and we are here to make New Zealand a better place. Kia ora, this is Voices, and I'm Kadambri Ragukumar. In March, Omer, a list MP since 2020, was selected as Labour's candidate in Wellington Central at this year's election. He's up against Tamatha Paul of the Green Party, Scott Sheeran of National, and Natalia Albert of the Opportunities Party. If he wins, Ibrahim takes over from Grant Robertson, who's held the seat since 2008. He calls Robertson his mentor and friend, and they now share the electorate office. Here's an excerpt from his parliamentary speech in 2020. Mr. Speaker, I end up with a final acknowledgement to all millions of people displaced around the world. Your courage in the face of unimaginable adversity will always inspire me. The reality is many millions of people will not have the luck that I have had. Until the world changes, innocent lives will continue to be lost and displaced in the hands of evil and war. That is what we must change. That is what we must change, Mr. Speaker. In my mother tongue, which is called Saho, I just wanted to say to these people, Sin Abliukani, which is I see you. Sin Arar Abiyukani, which is I feel you. Insha'Allah, Prile Sinakani, which I will be on your side and fight alongside you. Norera, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Tato Kato. Ibrahim Omer tells me his nomination is a challenge that he's all set to step up to. We're meeting at a hotel lobby in well, central Wellington. No coffee for this coffee lover. It's the tail end of Ramadan when we have this conversation. Ibrahim left his home country Eritrea in the early 2000s, spending a few years in Sudan before being offered settlement in New Zealand as a refugee in 2008. None of my family became a refugee, just me. My parents didn't live. They... they they didn't want me to leave Eritrea. They they tried to, um, you're too young, you never left the country, too risky. Um, they, they never wanted to let me go back. It took me about three months, over three months, to actually convince them that I don't have any future in this country. You guys see and know what's happening around, and these people are um, in the mission to destroy this country, and they use, um, because you hear like anyone who spoke, who's spoken about anything, disappear. Just disappear. And Omer didn't want to be another disappeared person in Eritrea. So in 2003, he crossed the border into Sudan, escaping potentially indefinite military service. I was drafted to the National Service at a very young age during the war with Ethiopia. And I was about um, 16 and a half. And the reason why is because Eritrea and Ethiopian army pushed inside our country, and uh, then they mobilized the whole population. All the government employees to stop the war front. Students, high schools, close. We were in high school, and they took us to the... I remember they, like, a city transport buses. They put us into buses, and they took us to the training camps. Once in New Zealand, he rose through the trade union movement and became first a list MP in 2020, before deciding he wanted to stand in Wellington Central. To win the nomination, he had to beat a strong slate of wannabe MPs. In your opinion, how, how big a part do you think being a former refugee and New Zealand's first African MP played in actually beating some other really potentially strong candidates for the same position? Oh, that's a very tricky question. But I suppose, I think for me, though, like when you come to, as a refugee to this country and politics is... Being in politics itself is off the limit. That's that's the mindset, right? So I wasn't. That was not different for me as well. And I think because of who I am, because of my story, I, I got a lot of attention. I think my um, me being an MP kind of became a, a big deal. I don't know if it's necessary or not, but 
when I when when Grant decided to step aside, a lot of people start calling me and and messaging like you've got to do this you've got to do this do you think that the, the the sort of expectation do you think it came mainly from the immigrant communities and refugee communities or was it across the board that people actually across the board and i th- i think even actually much more like from non immigrant and refugee and the the people who live in wellington people who call the wellington central home and for example people who are in the LAC people who are act party active party members but also even outside of that people who follow politics i think this is this will be good for you i think you should do this not only for you but for your community but also for the city itself as well since he became mp in 2020 he's been an active voice in both the immigrant and refugee communities across the country but this new nomination could well mean that set to change uh now part of the reason why i couldn't decide whether i should run for wellington central or not was that if i run for wellington central and then i'm going to be the local mp for wellington central i have to give it my 100% all my energy time and focus needed to be to wellington because that's going they going to need me here and and i was quite nervous about at this minute that my community that i am giving a voice to now are going to um lose the voice so my focus now is going to be wellington and wellingtonians because they are the ones who put me in this position as a nominee so obviously that, that's a good thing about it. it does come with the challenge and expectations so what do you think is your perhaps the biggest challenge that awaits you if you were to win what is the biggest challenge would it be the cost of living crisis would it mm. be job losses at the moment what's really squeezing people is the cost of living i think it's quite common not just wellington but nationwide um uh climate change is big and a lot of the cities and towns have have lacked resilience and because of that they were quite exposed so i think making wellington much more like resilient city in terms of infrastructure and that's going to be in housing it is the biggest issue to me i think there's a lot of we have a lot of homelessness we have a lot of um lack of enough social house public houses you worked with the unions in the past mm-hmm. and you campaigned for higher wages for a long time we're seeing job cuts across the country left right and center from the warehouse to zeno there's going to be a lot of expectation that labor could do better than yeah. than this we will especially we are and we will <laughs> especially for someone that worked in the unions yeah. before the average um increase in wages in new zealand uh, the wages increase by 8% and that's that means that that our um our wages can cope with of the high inflation so i'm always for um growing wages living wages went up to 26 dollar from 23 plus that's significant increase which makes me happy because this is something that's close to my heart you've got a hard working people that who uh, just because they can't cope in one wage or in one job they have to do multiple jobs 80 70 90 hours and that's not okay and a lot of these businesses are actually businesses that are afforded to pay you've got we see the ceos like getting hundreds of thousands of pay increase no one says anything about that then you've got the government to give us cleaners and security guards supermarket supermarket workers a dollar 50 pay increase and all of the sudden like oh the economy is going to die it's going to cause a job loss none of the if you look now the the jobs that being cut it's none of those jobs are actually jobs that paid minimum wage none of those jobs are being cut because the government increased the minimum wage by a dollar 50 so there is a lot of inconsistency that we need to work through in new zealand in 1980 up to, up to 1980 uh, 485 We're one of the most egalitarian country and we walk the way now from that now we are one of the most unequal country in developed world unless we address this it's actually things are always going to be ugly and to, and we're going to see much more struggle people are not being valued and get, getting paid for the good work that they do as far as jobs are concerned ibrahim knows pretty well the struggles of finding and holding down not just one but two When I first came obviously I didn't come looking for jobs looking for prosperity uh, or to be a politician I came looking for safety I got that but then um it was the GFC it was hard to get a job it took me a few months I hate 
being on unemployment benefit. I just wanted to work from day one. I even went to the farms and did fruit picking and stuff. It wasn't for me. And, and then I got my first job was security. Kind of got attacked, unfortunately. Left that. And then here in Tarnak Street, I got my first ever housekeeping job. So back uni doing full-time job and in one of the hotels here in Torres Street doing full-time job. 80 hours, that's minimum. Okay, I'm working. I'm killing myself here working every hour. And then, um, and then I can't even, I'm still struggling to save money. For me, it was just to save money for my study and stuff. But there are families who are entirely reliant on just wages. You know, some, some of them are actually single moms. A lot of them former refugees that who used to work with me at, at, uh, at Vic Uni. So I, I've always said this is unfair. That's why I got involved in activism and a union movement, tried, started to push for change. Because so everything that I do now, the voice that I make in parliament and and everything is inspired by lived experience, but also the experience of people around me. So in terms of the refugee intake right now, we have a quota of 1,500 per mm. year. Since the pandemic, we've mm. actually not really fulfilled that 1,500 per mm. year. Mm. Do you think that Labour could do better on that? Do you think we could begin to let in more people and actually fulfill that quota? The, the reason why we didn't reach our potential um, was because of COVID-19 purely. And the, 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 the plan was to reach 1,500 by June 2020. June 2020, we were well in pandemic, so we couldn't, we couldn't do that. But for the first time now, in 2023, by the end of 2023, uh, we will fulfill our quota, our obligation, and the 1,500 people would have arrived, would have come to New Zealand. So, and what about the percentage of that? You're looking at about 20% of those 1,500 from the Middle East and from Africa. Yeah. So the breakdown is is, it is always a question because at the moment the main focus have been in, in I think, Asia-Pacific. Uh, we haven't been giving um, other other regions, I think, fair share, for example. I think it can always, depending on what happened in the regions, I think we need to be resilient, we need to be flexible in terms of if a lot of crises are happening in Africa, we need to give Africa much attention. You've pushed quite hard for the hate speech legislation so far. You've often said that it's, a, it's an increasing threat in New Zealand and Labour's parked this now. The community is disappointed about about, uh, but we need to find a balance. And there was a lot of when government opened the discussion around this, the, you you would have seen the pushback. Do we want to go ahead with this legislation and then make anything, everything about the Muslim community, and then against? Because the perception was the Muslim community imposing these things on us. And what about our freedom of speech? Now, if you ask me as a Muslim MP, as someone who come from refugee back, I don't agree with that. But that was the perception. And, and there was a lot of pushback. Do we want to even to make the Muslim community hated more? So that's why the government it's needed, had to step back and said, but OK, um, this is a problem. So how can we find a middle ground that, that could potentially um, find a solution that could be accepted by both sides, find the middle ground. So that's why the prime minister and the government send the, the legislation back to the law commission. This legislation is very important to government, by the way, to the labor, because it's been uh, initiated by us as something that we said we will do when Jacinda was a prime minister. When we, and it's also part of one of the 44 recommendations as well. But it does need some work. We have to make it right. We have to make it um, acceptable by all the sides. But uh, to me, though, like eventually, everyone deserves it to feel safe. And, and live in peace in this country. What are the odds that you give yourself in terms of winning? What percentage of chance do you think you stand? Um, it is going to be tough. It is going to probably going to be, given all the candidates involved, are, we are all uh, more or less new. Yes, I am a sitting MP, list MP, but I don't have the profile that Grant had. Um, the Green Party had their own candidate. It's going to be tough, but we are into it to win it. And I have no doubt that by doing the right thing, running energetic and, and, and a successful campaign, we will retain the seat where I have no plan B. List MP Ibrahim Omer as his campaigning for Wellington Central seat is underway. That's Voices this week with me, Kadam Rida Gokumar. Each week I produce a story on people from all around the world who call New Zealand home. 
You can follow more Voices episodes on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. Today's episode was mixed by Blair Stagpool, and I'm Kadambri Raghukumar. Thanks for listening. Thank you.